Today is Wednesday, uh, April 5th, the year 2000, in uh, Palm Desert, California, with uh, Bill Stewart and Don Clark. Uh, Bill was a ball turret gunner on uh, B-17s in World War II. Uh, Bill, would you tell us, please, when and, and where were you born? I was uh, born and raised in New York City. Uh, I went to school, graduated at St. John's University, uh, June 41, and a buddy of mine and I went down to enlist in the Air Force, but we both had some minor physical defects and we were both rejected. We were very unhappy about that. We both wanted very badly to get into the Air Force. Uh, finally, the day of reckoning came and uh, the Army grabbed me and uh, uh, I was a graduate accountant and I was classified with their Army MOS as, a, as an accountant and being the Army, what it is, uh, I ended up in the infantry climbing trees like a telephone lineman. Anyway, one day the Air Force came up with a, uh, an examination for aviation cadets and I passed the exam and, and uh, by a miracle I was able to switch from the infantry to the Air Force. Uh, I got into the uh, aviation cadet program starting out at Maxwell Field, Alabama. I went through that and the next step was uh, in primary where we uh, learned how to fly. And I had the thrill of a lifetime when after 10 hours of instruction, I flew a Stearman. There's a picture of it on my shirt, <laughs> the old Stearman. And uh, I soloed and had the thrill of being thrown into the water or a shower, whatever they had to celebrate the solo feat. And that didn't last too long. The next day, I <clears throat> was put up for a check ride. What was happening was the old law of supply and demand was setting in, and the, <clears throat> the Air Force needed uh, gunners. They had enough uh, navigators, volunteers, and pilots coming through, and uh, so I was elected to be a gunner, and that's what happened. Went to gunnery school, became a wall turret gunner, and uh, uh, trained uh, with my crew, great bunch of guys in uh, South Dakota, Rapid City, South Dakota. And then we flew our own airplane up to, uh, uh, across the ocean to uh, England. And we started flying our combat missions about uh, October of 44. And uh, the timing, excuse me, can you cut it off? So we uh, started flying our combat missions around oh, September of 44. And uh, I flew the ball turret. And uh, after we had completed about 25 missions, one day my waist gunner, Jimmy Porter from Chicago, uh, said to me, uh, Bill, you're almost ready to go home. We have nine more missions to fly, and, and you haven't taken any pictures. I said, well, I can't take any pictures from that wall turret. I'm really cramped. In fact, I fly that position only wearing my harness uh, without the chest pack. The chest pack is up in, inside the plane. He said, I'll tell you what. He says, uh, let me fly the ball today, and uh, you fly the waist so you can take some pictures. And uh, without hesitation, I said, okay, it's a deal. I was glad to get out of the cramped ball. And I knew he was okay because I had to check everybody on the crew out to make sure they knew how to fly the ball. So we're coming in on, uh, on a target, November 4th, 44. And uh, the target was Merschberg, Germany. We were after their synthetic oil plants. And my bombardier called me up and said, uh, Bill, we're, we're 
dropping a slow train of 250 pounders, get the camera ready. So I said, okay, I'm ready. And no sooner did we finish our conversation, all hell broke loose. The sky blackened with flak. Uh, that ugly flak that throws out thousands of pieces of shrapnel and tears up the skin on the airplanes, the aluminum, come back with many holes. And uh, my bombardier wasn't wearing his protective goggles, and he got hit in the eye with uh, some flak and got the Purple Heart. And in the meantime, I had my camera focus out to the left, and all of a sudden, the plane flying off my left wing, about 40 feet off my left wing, got hit by a direct burst of flak, and uh, all hell broke loose. The orange and red flame, and uh, he started going down. I grabbed the shot and ducked behind the armor plate and uh, began praying like everybody else on the crew that we didn't get, didn't get hit. Anyway, we made it to the target, we dropped our bombs and went home. When we, and when we got back to the briefing, debriefing, I turned my film into S2, Intelligence. And uh, uh, they said, uh, we'll and then went and hit the chow line, which at that time was down to a reasonable weight. And then I went down to the uh, <laughs> to the office to see this picture and uh, this big six foot four sergeant says to me uh, uh, what makes you think I'm going to show you your picture? I said, you SOB. I said, this is my film, my camera, and you're not going to show me my picture? And I was ready to tangle with him because I had, I, I, I was teed off. And just then, a captain walked in from uh, into the office and said, what are you guys fighting about? So uh, the sergeant told him that the picture's been classified secret, and he can't show it to me. So I looked at the captain and I said, you know, that picture's up in here in Technicolor for the rest of my life, and he won't show me a lousy black and white picture. So the captain says, uh, let him see the picture. And uh, it was a pretty good picture. It was published in all the papers in the United States and uh, overseas. And take a break, we need a drink. And uh, this captain was the uh, intelligence officer, and he's also the head of uh, PRO, which I didn't know what it was, the Public Relations Office. And uh, he offered me a job as, as photographer. And I said, oh, no, I'm going to finish up my nine missions and go home and, you know, I want to finish up with my crew. He says, well, before you give me an answer, he says, think it over and go around and speak to to your crew and get their feelings on it. So I decided to take his advice and I went around and spoke to uh, every man on the crew and they all agreed that I should stay and do my photography because I've been doing it since high school and college and I enjoy it. So they said they'll get another all turret gun and finish up and go home, you know. So I accepted the job and uh, it was uh, it's quite interesting. Uh, they had some maybe five or six uh, fellows in the office and all of them, most of them were attorneys uh, who were writing these articles and it was a good morale booster for people at home. For example, I'd go out and uh, make a date with the uh, crew chief and have maybe 30 or 40 of his uh, men show up and i uh, shoot pictures of them all. And uh, usually out of the B-17 with the V for Victory sign 
and uh, uh, bring the pictures uh, uh, into the photo lab and they would process it and I'd come back to the office with about oh, nine prints and the, the writers in the PRO office would uh, send articles back to the hometown newspapers, uh, typically uh, uh, Joe, Joe White, son of Mr. and Mrs. Joe White in Des Moines, Iowa, uh, showing him revving up the planes that dropped their bombs over Germany. And uh, it was really a great morale booster for the people at home to see this being done. <clears throat> and then some of the uh, jobs entailed uh, going out and shooting pictures of weddings and and different uh, celebrities coming around to the base. And, uh, Bill, let, and me, let me take you back, if I could, for just sure. a second. You were, you were born in New York City. Correct. Uh, what, what, uh, what was the date that you were born there? Uh, October 4, 1919. And do you remember uh, uh, what it was like growing up in New York back in, uh, in those days? Can you tell us a little about that? <clears throat> uh, what your family was like, what your dad did, your mom, brothers or sisters? Well, uh, life was uh, kind of rough in those days. The uh, uh, dollar then is, uh, was really worth a dollar, not what it's, it's now. It's like a penny or a nickel now. Uh, I know as a kid, if I wanted any money, I went out and caddied. And, and spend uh, uh, <clears throat> 12, 15 hours getting out to the golf course. And if I was lucky, I got a bag to carry and came back with 75 cents. And that was a day's wages, a day's work for 12, 14 hours. Uh, things got better when I, I belonged to a uh, social athletic club. About 25 of us were all buddies went to school at the same time and we played baseball with the uh, PAL, which is the Police Athletic League, and uh, we did a lot of that, even played a little tennis. Uh, the, uh, the cost of a summer permit in New York City, playing all summer on clay courts was one dollar, and it was a great deal. And then as, the, as we grew older, we, we had uh, what we call basement clubs where we'd have music and girls and dance. And uh, we were all teenagers and we had a pretty good time. And uh, how were you able to, to finance your university education? That was back in the hard days then, before a lot of federal grants were available for <clears throat> The, uh, it wasn't easy. I, I saved some money doing odd jobs and uh, uh, did uh, get some assistance from uh, NYA, New York Assistance, where the city had a deal where you could uh, uh, get 30 hours work in at 50, 50 cents an hour. So I was able to make $15 a month, which I used toward my education. And I even remember what my college education cost me, $1,096. I paid for about half of it, and my folks paid for the other half. And in contrast to uh, then and now, I went to St. John's University of Brooklyn, New York, great basketball team. Uh, I was paying $8 per credit. And my grandson went to USC. I asked him one day what he was paying per credit. He said, Grandpa, are you sitting down? He says, yeah. He says, $500 a credit. So things have changed. <laughs> Did you have any uh, any brothers or sisters? Uh, I had two brothers, and uh, they uh, one was in the navy, and one was in the, in the 
merchant marine, and uh, it was pretty darn rough on uh, on my parents. They they were had, having three sons in the service. Are they older or younger? Uh, they they were uh, both uh, older. Uh -huh. Okay. And uh, I remember when I came home, <clears throat> uh, my dad told me about listening to the news at that time, I think it was uh, Edward R. Morrow, who would start off his program and say, well, we lost another 60 planes today, you know. And my folks would hear that, and not knowing whether I had made it back or not. So I think it was rough on them, because when I got back to a mission, uh, we, uh, we knew we were safe and sound, go see a movie or go into town and have a beer or off and off and maybe go to a dance. But uh, my folks didn't know where I was and whether I was safe or sound. Uh, I, th I think it was rougher on, on, on them than it was on me, honestly. Yeah. What, uh, what were you doing? On December 7th, when, when the news broke that Pearl Harbor had been attacked. Do you remember? Yeah, it was a <clears throat> Sunday evening, and uh, it, uh, uh, it came back from the park. I think I was playing ball and got the news, and uh, we were quite upset, to say the least. I mean, it was kind of a stab in the back technique that the Japs use and uh, it shook us all up quite a bit and uh, really changed our lives around. How long after that did you uh, attempt your, your enlistment, uh, I think you said? That uh, I attempted to enlist shortly after that. My buddy and I went down to enlist and we both were rejected for slight uh, medical reasons. and. Uh, uh, but a few months later, they uh, uh, drafted us both and uh, got into the service at that time. So, uh, you went through gunnery training uh, in, in Mac at Maxwell? No, no. Maxwell Field, we went through aviation cadet okay. training. After I washed out of pilot training, uh, <clears throat> I got into gunnery training and we uh, down in Hollingen, Texas, and uh, it uh, was a good experience. How long was the uh, gunnery training down there, do you remember? The gunnery training was about three or four months. Uh -huh. And then uh, then you went to, to South Dakota, North Dakota for crew training? Yeah, then, then we went to a staging area, I think it was in Nebraska, and uh, they, uh, the Army uh, selected a crew, put us all together for training, and we did that in Rapid City, South Dakota, which was a great spot to fly over. I still remember flying over the, uh, the uh, four presidents in the mountain. Uh, uh, and then uh, I guess you got a little leave and then you went overseas? Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, what, what Air base where you stationed over there? Uh, in, in London, in England? Uh -huh. uh, was based in Sudbury. I was with the 486 bomb group. And uh, so, how long were you there before you had your first combat mission? Uh, about two or three months. We had some practice missions locally. When did you, uh, when did you arrive over there? Uh, July 4th, 1944. And left July 5th, 1945. That's a nice rounding off. Yeah, it? One, one year and one day. Uh, so you, 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 you trained for two or three months and then you went on your first mission and uh, can you tell me, uh, if you recall, what it was like on that, that first mission? What, what went through your mind when you, were, you knew you were going to be in a combat role and, 
and uh, maybe get shot at and, and uh, injured or, or worse. Well, <clears throat> I just felt that we had a job to do and come hell or high water we are going to do it. And, uh, uh, just prayed that uh, we we're going to live through it and do our job. So you, you then flew another uh, t a total of 25 missions? Yes, 25 in a ball turret and one in a waste. So it was a total of 26 missions. 26 missions total. In fact, after I uh, flew the 26 missions, uh, I took on this job as PRO photographer, and the deal was I was going to fly uh, one combat mission a month to make up for the nine remaining uh -huh, missions. Uh -huh. And uh, in order to get your flight pay, which is 50% right. additional base pay, so one day I went down, I needed the flying time, I went down to sign up for a mission. And uh, the guy says, what's your name? I tell him, he says, he checks the list, he come back and says, you know, he says, uh, we have so many gunners around here, we don't need them, and uh, we, we decided to give you credit for a full tour of 35 missions. So you don't have to fly nine combat missions. You're all done. Man, I felt good. I went out and really celebrated that night. And I imagine it was like some some prison, some prisoner in the, in jail having nine more years to go, and the warden coming along and says, uh, "Okay, Merry Christmas. Go home. You're you're all done. No more nine years." So. It was quite a thrill I getting bet. that I bonus. Uh, you, uh, so that the last mission you flew then was on the 4th of November, uh, 44. Correct. And so you, mm -hmm. you, you, that was the, that was the end of it. Uh, did you, uh, did you feel that your military training uh, uh, was adequate or on target or less than adequate? How did you feel about that? Well, uh, the uh, the infantry training, I just as soon forget about it. I didn't enjoy <laughs> climbing trees. <laughs> but the, uh, the Air Force training was excellent. Uh, I remember one mission, I was down in a ball turret and uh, all of a sudden, I felt like I had a million guys sticking a million pins into my head, and my head started throbbing, and my training and instinct said, check things out, there's something wrong. And I had enough strength to look around, and I discovered my oxygen tube had become dislodged from the other tube and I wasn't getting any oxygen. Mm -hmm. And uh, you're, you're good for one minute up there at 30,000 feet without oxygen and uh, called an oxy, I believe. And I had enough strength to put the clamps together and my right hand dropped down to the red button on the bottom, which turned on the, the emergency supply. And I turned it on, and it sure felt good. In fact, I got too much. And when you get too much, it's like getting drunk real quick. And I came out of it, and I got on the intercom. And I chewed out the whole crew. I said, what happened to the buddy system today? Who's been checking on me lately, you know? But anyway, all's well that ends well. Yeah, yeah. Uh, when did you uh, actually enter the, the, the ball itself? Were you, you weren't there for takeoff or landings, I presume. No, no. Uh -huh. So you would go in at some later point. When would that be? Uh, when we're leaving the uh, English uh, coast, uh, we'd uh, get into the ball turret, and that is, I got into the and uh, we got over to the channel. We would test fire our guns to make sure they're working properly. And stayed in a ball turret until we 
dropped up arms on target, came back home, and then when we hit the the uh, coast of France or Germany, whatever it was, coming back over the English Channel, I was able to get out. And uh, and most of us would save our oranges that we got in the morning, and when we got back over the English Channel, we cut them open with a knife, and that orange, frozen orange, tasted so good. I think Orange Julius might have been in the Air Force when he picked that trick up. Those were good oranges. Uh, there wasn't a lot of room in that turret, was there? Oh, no. They very, very cramped. Uh, some of the little guys were fortunate. They were able to get in and use a backpack. So it was kind of a pillow, and they had their parachute with them in case anything happened to the trap tour or something. They, were, they could roll out and be on their way with the parachute. But I had no such luck. All I wore was my harness and my chest back. It was, it was impossible to wear it in the in the wall turret because I had my uh, my gun sights in front of me, and there was no room. So my parachute was out in the radio room close by, in case I was I would ever need it. Did you uh, ever wish that you were at a different position in the airplane other than the, the ball turret? Or were you satisfied uh, performing there? Uh, everybody was trained for their specific task, and uh, I felt I had good training. I knew what I was doing, and uh, it was a position no one else wanted, so I was stuck with it, but I made the, mo the best uh, of it. Yeah. When, you were, uh, when you were flying along there and you had on your headset, were you able to monitor uh, communications from outside the aircraft or just the intercommunication within the, the aircraft itself? No, I had no no way of monitoring. The only way, I was on the intercom with all my crew. Okay, okay. The monitoring was done by perhaps a pilot, co-pilot, or maybe the radio man. So they, they couldn't jam your your uh, your interphone, the, the, the enemy couldn't jam no. that. It was just the others, okay, okay. Um, Excuse me, uh, you, you just, with you, you, your, your use of the word jamming reminds me of another incident. Uh, whenever we went on missions, in order to jam the, the German radar to mess them up, uh, we took along boxes of, of uh, silver uh, strips. It was called chef. And, uh, it was up to the tail gunner in the back to dump the stuff through a tube and it floated down the ground and mess up their, their radar. And my tail gunner was uh, a farmer from Northern California. His name was Clem, six foot two, very quiet, very unassuming. Never had much to say, but one day he cut it on the intercom and he broke us all up. He had to go potty. And he took one of these empty cardboard boxes. He did his duty and shoved it over overboard. He said, well, fellas, I finally did it on Germany. <laughs> Can we take a cut? <laughs> Pretty please? Okay. Okay, it's flicking red. Is that what it's supposed to be? Mm -hmm. Okay. That means that. Let's see, now you were, you were coming back uh, uh, from the from the uh, from a mission, you'd get out of the turret at about the time you got back in, uh, I guess, safe territory around the English coast. Uh, what kind of experience did you have with the uh, with the fighter escorts uh, on your on your missions? And do you think that they were as necessary as as some people have uh, have thought? You know, the P-47s, the P-51s, and the. Uh the pilots that flew the P-47s and the P-51s uh, were unbelievable. They were great. I wouldn't be sitting here talking now if, uh, if those guys weren't up to snuff. 
especially when the P-51s had the, uh, the uh, uh, new tanks put on where it extended their range and they were able to give us uh, more mileage on escorting us to the target. And uh, we, we had a lot of good fighter protection. Our worst enemy was, uh, was the flak. Mm -hmm. uh, those, uh, some of those uh, gunners, uh, German gunners, were, were masters. I mean, they were really, really good at it. And that flak is real dangerous. In fact, uh, there's a flak gun out the front of the Air Museum now. It's an old 88. Hmm. And, uh... You had a stopping point? <laughs> I'm going to go to Rouse. There it is, yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, the, uh, uh, the, the escort, and after they got their tanks, their drop tanks, they were able to extend the range. Right. Mm -hmm. Gave you a lot of help uh, getting there and back. Let me ask you this, Bill. Do you remember, you know, your, 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 your crew members? Do you, you guys ever get together or oh, ever yes. talk to them or mm -hmm. anything like that? Uh, we, uh, uh, my pilot and I just found each other. After 50 years, uh, he moved from Kentucky to South Carolina, and I moved from New York to California, so we missed each other. But through the use of computers, we finally located each other, and uh, uh, I called him, and we hadn't spoken to each other in 50 years. It was quite a reunion over the telephone. And then we, <clears throat> we've seen each other on recent uh, bomb group uh, uh, conventions. And uh, the, uh, the uh, man that took my place, who replaced me as a ball turret gunner, uh, was there too. Uh, Tony Garcia from Brooklyn. <laughs> Another Brooklyn night. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, we, we keep in touch. Yeah. Uh, you attend reunions ever? Yes, uh-huh. We uh, attended one recently in Savannah, Georgia, where where it happened to be the, the home of, uh, of the 8th Air Force Museum, which was quite a thrill to, to be there and see it. I guess. Uh, what about... Uh, uh, your life after after the war, when you when you returned uh, in uh, July of '45, uh, uh, how long before you were demobilized or, or turned loose from the Air Force? Uh, I was discharged in uh, September of '45, and uh, uh, all the time that I was away from New York, I kept saying, "Boy, there's no place like New York." I got back after I was discharged. I couldn't stand the town. I said, I I'm going to California. But in the meantime, I had met my, uh, uh, this gal who would, we dated for about, oh, six weeks, maybe two months. And uh, I decided to break loose to California. And I came out to California about November of 45. In December, I called Pearl and proposed. I says, come on out to California and get married. She said, oh, no, you come back to Brooklyn and get married. So I went back to Brooklyn. Got married and came back to, uh, to California. At that time, I was working for an accountant. And he got excited when he heard I was wanted two weeks off. He says, he says what are you, crazy? You work three weeks and you want two weeks off? I said, I don't like your tone of voice. I quit. He said, wait a minute. He says, how come you want to go to New York? I said, I don't want to go to New York. He said, will you be back in the tax season? I said, yeah, I'll be back in the tax season. <laughs> Which started off with my first tax return I did was for Hoot Gibson. And he walked in bow-legged. He, he was so bow-legged, he looked like he still had a horse underneath his legs. It was great experience doing his tax return. <laughs> And so uh, you settled then in what, what's, what town? When you got married, came back? We uh, bought our first house in uh, San Fernando Valley, uh, Reseda, California. And uh, then I had to get to work and 
make some money to support a family. So I was an accountant and uh, I worked for an oil company and uh, uh, after a while I wanted to get into income taxes so I got a job with the California State Franchise Tax Board doing income tax audits and uh, it was quite an experience. More experiences than I got going to college. I mean, meeting people, seeing different sets of books, listening to different approaches, and uh, it was uh, six or seven years I stayed there well spent. Then one day I realized I wasn't getting too far, so I said, okay, this is it. I'm going to break away and go into business for myself, which I did. And we ate beans for about the first year or so, but then things started picking up and got more and more accounts. And got to be better known, and uh, uh, we uh, then moved to uh, Monterey Park. Lived there for about 20 years. Brought my son and my daughter up there, and uh, they were chips off the old block. They took the tennis, and they were on the tennis teams, and we became. Uh, traveling with the uh, tennis leagues, watching them play in tournaments. And uh, then we moved to Pacific Palisades, which is a beautiful area up off of near Malibu in the hills, near the ocean. And uh, we really enjoyed that area. finally came the day when he trained to be 65. I said, okay, now's the time to retire. So we sold out Pacific Palisades and came down to uh, Palm Springs. And uh, my son had bought a business in Palm Springs, so we came down to help. But uh, it didn't work out that way. I came down with uh, cancer. And I had 29 treatments of uh, lymphoma, but uh, I'm a survivor and I'm still here. We beat it. Yeah. <laughs> Bill, how would you uh, how would you say that your wartime experience has influenced your life, if you can, if if you can even say that, or <clears throat> you know, I'm sure you've thought about it a lot because you spent number of years of your life as a young man, service to your country in a dangerous uh, profession, and uh, you survived it, you got to come back, to, you, you, you met Pearl, got married, uh, had, had the American life, you know, that we, that we talk about. Uh, how, did, how did doing what you did influence your life, doing what you did in the war? Well, the, uh, the only thing that has happened is I carry uh, good memories and bad memories. And uh, I'm thankful for having lived through the experience of everything I've, I've done. And uh, I feel that I've gained a lot from the experience. And, uh, appreciate life and uh, what it has to offer. I know you've got a, uh, a memento of, uh, of your uh, military life uh, on the back of the chair there. I wonder if you would uh, model that for us. Sure, this is my jacket, A2 jacket. This is the back of it. Check job with 26 bombs, one for each mission. I have to tell you about check job. Named after, the plane was named after my bombardier who went out on practice missions and hit the shack in the middle of the bullseye, and we called him check job. But then he was also good at the other stuff, too. And uh, yeah, the jacket still fits me. And one rainy night in England, I drew a picture of my dream girl, 
then I met her, and we got married. It's been over 54 years ago. And I also have another memento called my short snorter. My short snorter, short snorter is uh, when you fly overseas, uh, every member of the crew signs a dollar bill. And uh, if you ever come across anybody that's flown overseas and you ask him who's a short snorter and he doesn't have his dollar bill with him, then he either owes you a drink or has to give you a dollar. So over the years, I've accumulated bills from all the foreign countries and uh, it is now 14 feet long. Don and I measured it a few minutes ago, and uh, it's a great souvenir I have, and quite a conversation piece. And I have signatures. One night I went down to the USO in New York, and all the actors and actresses were there, and I got signatures from Douglas Fairbanks Jr., Martha Ray, and, and a bunch of other people. I don't remember, but it's a nice souvenir. I enjoy it. I'm running out of souvenirs, Don. <laughs> okay. There it is. It's on now. Okay. I'm uh, I'm 80 years old. I've been smoking a pipe since I was 17 years old, and I'm not quitting. But I must tell you about one mission that I was on. It was two days after the war ended in Europe, May 9, 1945. The instructions were to get every airplane off the ground that could fly for a victory sweep over Europe. The night before the mission, I got drunk with some kids from Texas. And I said, Tex, I said, when we get over Paris, I said, I want you to fly low. I want to take a portrait of the guy selling tickets under the Eiffel Tower. He said, OK, you got a deal. So we took off for this mission, and I sat up in the nose of the plane, not in the ball turret, in the nose of the plane, the sunshine pouring down. And I had my pipe lit, something I could not do in the ball turret. And I was in seventh heaven. We flew over the Rhine River, and I could practically reach out and touch both sides of the mountains on the, on the top of the river. And we really enjoyed this mission. It was a thrill. When we got over Paris, I've got a picture, believe it or not, pointing up at the Eiffel Tower. And I was close enough to see some gal, French gal, hanging out the window, and she was going like this. I didn't know whether she meant V for victory or she was charging two francs. Anyway, we flew over some beautiful looking tennis courts where they now play the French Open, Roland, Roland, something like that. And that was a mission that I shall long remember. We got back safe and sound, no flak or anything like that. It was a beautiful mission to be on. Thank God I made it.